How do you treat the trauma patient? How do you do your initial assessment for trauma? Today we're going to be talking about the initial assessment for trauma and I have a whole series of videos to follow to get you comfortable with this really important topic. All right, let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon and I've created the Citizen Surgeon platform to help you get more comfortable on the wards, in the ICU, in the operating room, and of course to help you crush your exam. This is great supplemental education for you if you're a medical student, a resident, or maybe even an attending resetting your board exams. And if you haven't had a chance to subscribe, hit the subscribe button, turn on the notifications so you can be aware when that next video is coming out. Also, check out citizensurgeon.com. Sign up for the community. Sign up for the Saturday 6 newsletter and be a part of it. I mean, I got a lot of things that I'm excited about that are changing, so I hope you'll check out Citizen Surgeon. If you have any feedback, get back to me. I'm super excited about scaling surgical education. So, let's talk about trauma. So trauma, why do we have to know about trauma? Well, trauma is so important because if you know the basics and the essentials of trauma, you will save lives. If you can follow along and know how to resuscitate a sick and potentially dying patient, you will be able to save lives not only in the trauma bay, but on the ward, in the ICU, and in the operating room when a significant event happens. All the principles are the same. When I have a sick patient on the ward or in the ICU, I think, how do I treat this patient like a trauma patient? I think of those principles, airway, breathing, circulation, disability. We're gonna talk about it all today, get you super comfortable with this topic because it is so important. For our references today, I'm gonna to direct you to three spots. Number one is the EAST guidelines for trauma. If you haven't had a chance, check out the EAST guidelines, do it right now or at least after this video. I'm gonna put a link in the description below so you can check it out. But the EAST guidelines are put together. They have awesome criteria for how to treat almost every facet of trauma, and it is an excellent resource. It is a must read if you are a medical student, resident, or an attending surgeon. So check that out. The second is the trauma book. This is the Trauma Bible by Maddox, and I use this for several of the different points today. And then third is the ATLS, or Advanced Trauma Life Support Student Manual. A lot of gold information here. If you are a student of trauma, whether you're a medical student or a resident, or you're a pre-hospital provider or a nurse, this is a go the gold standard for how to treat the trauma patient, so another excellent reference. So where does the initial assessment management of the trauma patient begin? Well, it begins in the field. It begins in the pre-hospital phase. As you can see here, there are two phases to managing the trauma patient. There's the pre-hospital phase, which I'm gonna go over, and there's the intra-hospital phase. So in the pre-hospital phase, this is where I give a shout out to the EMTs, to the paramedics, to our pre-hospital providers, firefighters, policemen. These are the people that are showing up to a trauma scene and taking care of that patient. They're making field decisions. They're thinking about scene safety. They're thinking about body substance isolation or BSI. And then they're going through a bunch of decisions to find out, does this patient meet criteria to go to a trauma center? And so what are some of those criteria? Let's say you show up at a scene like this. You have multiple patients, multiple victims of trauma. You have the fire trucks on scene. There's a vehicle on fire and you have to start to identify which patients need to go to a trauma center. Well, some of the first questions you might ask are when you do your evaluation, you're gonna check for initially airway, breathing, circulation, we're gonna go over with that. And then you look at some specifics. So does this person have a GCS less than 13? Do they have a systolic blood pressure that's less than 90? Do they have a respiratory rate that's less than 10 or over 30? If they have these things, then those are patients that you're gonna to wanna to transfer to a trauma center for further evaluation. When you do your evaluation, you're gonna be looking at other things on secondary survey. So does the patient have a penetrating chest wound? Do they have flail chest? 
Do they have a two or more long bone fractures? Do they have a crushed pelvis or a mangled extremity? This list is a collection of injuries that definitely need to be evaluated at a trauma center. Pre-hospital providers also take into account the mechanism of injury. So aside from the injuries, they're gonna ask themselves, is this a fall from greater than 20 feet? Was this a high risk motor vehicle crash? Was this a auto versus pedestrian accident? Was this a motorcycle crash? If they answer yes to some of those questions, they'll want to transport to a trauma center. And then they're also gonna ask themselves, does this patient fit into any particular group? So is this an elderly patient? Is this a child? Is this a burn victim? Is this a pregnant patient? Or is this a patient that's on anticoagulants? Any of those things answer yes. You're going to transport to a trauma center. And the last thing is if the field personnel, the pre-hospital providers are worried and perhaps they haven't said yes to any or all of those questions, certainly not all of them, <laughs> but if they're worried, they're gonna to wanna to transport to a trauma center for further evaluation and care of that patient. And so I don't wanna to get too deep into the pre-hospital phase, and I'm gonna leave that to our pre-hospital providers, my EMTs, paramedics, firemen, policemen, thank you so much for everything that you do. And I hope that you're not upset that I'm not going more deep in the pre-hospital phase. That is definitely your expertise. My expertise is on the intra-hospital phase. So let's get to that. So once it's decided that the patient is gonna be transported to the trauma center, the trauma team is gonna get ready to accept this patient. And when I look at the trauma resuscitation, I look at three major events. So the first thing is the trauma timeout. The second thing is the trauma resuscitation of that patient. And the third event is the trauma debrief where we learn as a team what went right and what could be improved. So let's talk about the trauma timeout. So when I lead a trauma resuscitation, I like to make sure that the trauma team is assembled and ready at least five to 10 minutes before that patient arrives if you're given enough time. That way you can find out and make sure that all the correct people are present and also that you have your setup ready. If you're expecting a patient that is severely injured, you wanna make sure that you have everything you need to get a safe airway. Do you have your ultrasound machine so you can do an e-fast? Do you have your chest tubes set up so that you can vent the chest or place chest tubes if they're needed emergently? Is x-ray in the room to get those images that you might need to confirm airway placement or if somebody has a particular pathology? It's always important to make sure that you do a trauma timeout and that's done with the trauma leader so you can make sure that you have everything from equipment to personnel to blood to imaging, those basic necessities to run a safe trauma resuscitation. Okay, so let's get into the trauma resuscitation. Now the other thing is how do you set up your trauma bay? How do you set up that bed? And I'm gonna take you through how I like to see the trauma bay set up. So if we take this diagram here, I'm gonna fill in some yellow circles that are gonna show you the personnel that I think are really important to an effective trauma resuscitation. So first is you have the patient lying on the bed and at the head of the bed, that's where you want your airway physician, whether this is an emergency medicine physician or if this is an anesthesiologist, you want your airway person at the head of the bed with all the equipment they need for a safe airway. Second is the team leader. The team leader stands at the foot of the bed so that they can see everything going on and direct the physicians that are resuscitating the patient and the nurses that are assisting with that resuscitation. Third is the examining doctor, which I like on the patient's right. And that person is gonna perform the primary survey and lead into the secondary survey. Next to the airway physician, you have the respiratory tech and they're gonna assist the airway physician with securing that airway if that needs to be done, hooking up the ventilator if that needs to be done, or assisting with any other maneuvers that need to be done for a safe airway. 
Next is the scribe. They're gonna be sitting adjacent to the team leader so they can write down and record everything that the examining physician is gonna be shouting out in the primary survey. That the airway is clear, that the breath sounds are equal and bilateral, that the pulse is regular and strong, or that these things aren't and an intervention needs to happen. Usually in addition, on each side of the patient, we'll have medics that'll assist with IV access, administering drugs, administering fluids. Then of course, we'll have a nurse that's responsible for uh, organizing the, phys the medications and helping them being delivered. So when you have all this set up, you're ready to accept that patient for the trauma resuscitation. So let's get into that. Trauma resuscitation begins with the primary survey. And the primary survey is really easy to remember as long as you know the alphabet. So A, B, C, D, and E. So when we go through airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure, the examining physician should be able to examine these within about 10 seconds. A stands for airway, and that is the most important thing. Without an airway, there is no hope. You can easily examine the airway by saying, Annie, Annie, are you okay? Or if you have the patient's name, or if you don't, you just say, hey, what's your name? If somebody can give you a clear name and is speaking fine with no distress, then their airway and breathing are usually clear. Now, one thing to, to remember about the primary survey is that it's very dynamic. You're going to be constantly evaluating things like the Glasgow Coma Score, which we're going to go into. And if you have a declining Glasgow Coma Score, let's say it reaches greater than eight, either on arrival or during the primary survey or secondary survey, then the patient's airway can no longer be safe and you may have to get a definitive airway. We're going to talk about that. If somebody is not responding to you, there are a few maneuvers that you begin with. First is to examine for a foreign body. This could be something like dentures or it could be a foreign object. Second is to look for facial, mandibular, uh, laryngeal, tracheal fractures. And then third is to start suctioning secretions and suctioning blood away so you can get a better look at the airway. In order to open up that airway, an initial jaw thrust maneuver can be performed and that will, if done correctly, keep the cervical spine safe or an oral pharyngeal airway in an unconscious patient or a nasopharyngeal airway in a conscious patient can help you get air moving through or oxygen moving through into the lungs. If you have any doubt that you do not have a clear airway, then you wanna establish a definitive airway right away and you wanna do this with minimal cervical spine movement. You wanna protect the cervical spine at all times. Now we get to breathing and ventilation. So breathing and ventilation is moving air in and out of the lungs. So if you have a clear airway, you wanna find out now, are we moving air in and out of the lungs? You wanna expose, examine, and auscultate. When you expose the patient, you're able to look at the chest. Maybe one chest is significantly raised compared to the other. You might find this in a tension pneumothorax. You might also look for things like a flailed chest, rib fractures, paradoxical movement. So we expose, we examine, and we auscultate, and we find out, do we have clear breath sounds on both sides? If we do, then we can say that we have clear breath sounds. If we don't, then we have to start thinking about things that are causing those reduced breath sounds. So one thing I like to think about when I'm doing my trauma resuscitation, particularly in evaluating breathing, is what are quick killers. So three quick killers that come with evaluating breathing are number one, a tension pneumothorax, number two, a massive hemothorax, or number three, an open pneumothorax or a sucking chest wound. If you discover these things, then you have to treat them on identification. You are, when you move through the primary survey, you're identifying and treating the whole time. You don't just go through A, B, C, D, and E, and then go back. At each step, if you find something wrong, you fix it, and then you move to the next step. Now talking about quick killers, there are six quick killers in trauma, and it's important to identify these. So let's look at them. 
The first is airway obstruction, and that comes with evaluating the airway. If you have an obstructive body in the airway, you're not going to be able to move oxygen, you're not going to be able to remove CO2, and so that's going to need to be fixed. Second is a tension pneumothorax. If you have movement of the mediastinum and the great vessels due to increasing air in the chest, that must be relieved or you're going to have a dying patient. Third is cardiac tamponade. If your heart is not able to fill, you're not going to be able to have cardiac output and needed to sustain life. Fourth is open pneumothorax or a sucking chest wound. When this happens, instead of the lungs expanding on inspiration and contracting on expiration, they move paradoxically and they move according to pleural pressure. So when you take a deep breath in, the lung on that side actually contracts and when you breathe out, it expands. So you need to solve that sucking chest wound. Five is massive hemothorax. If you have a massive collection of blood in the chest, not only are you gonna be hypovolemic, but that can also shift the heart and the grace vessels over and create obstructive shock, shock, both obstructive and hypovolemic shock. And six is flail chest, which leads to poor dynamics, inspiration and expiration, and you have to solve this problem as well. So these are six things to think about when you're evaluating a trauma patient, and you need to both identify and treat these things in order to save your patient. So now we get to circulation. We've talked about airway, we've talked about breathing. Now circulation, circulation is really blood volume and cardiac output. And hypovolemic shock from bleeding is the leading cause of preventable death and trauma. And so on evaluating the trauma patient, you wanna feel their pulse, find out if they have a regular strong pulse. If they have a weak and thready pulse, you wanna quickly identify if they are bleeding and where the source of bleeding is. You want to try to quickly control the hemorrhage if that's possible in your setting. And three, initiate volume resuscitation. And one thing I want to talk about is what are three clues to, to know that somebody's bleeding or know that somebody is in hypovolemic shock. So if they're not overtly bleeding into the environment, you want to think of these three things. So number one, do they have a change in their level of consciousness? Depressed level of consciousness, while it can also be attributed to other types of shock and alcohol or drug ingestion, decreased level of consciousness can be a clue that somebody's bleeding. Second is skin perfusion, and they have decreased perfusion, that's a sign that they can be bleeding. And three, feeling their pulse. If they have a nice, strong, bounding pulse, that's reassuring. If they have a weak or thready pulse, either at the radial or at the femoral, then that's a clue that they may be in hypovolemic shock from bleeding. Now, when somebody bleeds, there are six places that they bleed. So where are these six places? So after trauma, somebody can bleed into the environment. Maybe they have a gunshot to the groin and they're bleeding from the femoral artery out onto the street. That is an example of bleeding into the external, bleeding in the environment. They can bleed into their abdomen. Somebody in a motor vehicle accident has a tearing in the mesentery. That patient's gonna be bleeding in the abdomen or bleeding from a splenic or a solid organ injury like the liver. You can bleed into the retroperitoneum. So if you have an aortic transection, you can also bleed into your chest. So massive hemothorax in the chest. And you can bleed into the extremities. So if you have a femoral, fra femoral bone fracture, that's a big bone. That causes not only a lot of soft tissue injury, but if there's an injury that's a high enough energy injury to break that bone, you're gonna have a lot of soft tissue damage and a lot of blood collecting in that compartment. And finally, the pelvis, you can lose a lot of blood in your pelvis, especially following motor vehicle accidents, and patients can lose a lot of blood into this space and be in hypovolemic shock quite quickly. So these are the six spaces to think about. You have the external environment, abdomen, retroperitoneum, the thorax, the pelvis, and of course the extremities. One thing I wanna reiterate is that you must get definitive control of the bleeding. And this is why surgeons are instrumental in caring for the trauma patient. But when you can't immediately control the bleeding, then you must volume resuscitate. So let's take this patient. So you have a 37-year-old male who's involved in a motor vehicle crash, presents the trauma bay, he's already intubated, blood is coming out of the pharynx and the face, you can say, tell that there's obvious facial fractures, 
He has clear breath sounds. He's satting 100%, but his pulse is thready and weak. What do you do? So first, to continue the primary survey after airway, breathing, and now circulation, you found a problem, all right? And so now you gotta start to solve that problem. And you can't move on to the next step in the primary survey until you've started treatment. So how do we solve this problem? We start with IV access. So you want two large bore, 16 gauge IVs if you can, 18 gauge IVs in bilateral upper, upper extremities. And you resuscitate with a liter of crystalloid. If a liter of crystalloid does not produce an improvement, you don't wanna keep giving crystalloid. At this point, you wanna transition over to blood. Now, we're not gonna get into the depths of massive transfusion protocol or one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one transfusion, but I will put some links in the description that you can link to, read about this, and then we're gonna talk about it, of course, in future trauma videos. So now we get to D. So we've done airway, breathing, circulation, and now we're at disability. So with disability comes the Glasgow Coma Score. Now the GCS is something that as a medical student it might be tough to memorize, but you gotta practice. Practice with your friends. I'm gonna show you this table and know it till you can get it right because when you're that trauma leader or you're that examining physician, you have a very sick and injured patient coming into your trauma bay, you wanna immediately be able to calculate this score and help you determine if they have a possible head injury, if they need a definitive airway. The nice thing about the Glasgow Coma Score is that it's simple, safe, and effective to use. It's very quick, and of course, it guides your trauma management. So let's look at it. So the Glasgow Coma Score has three variables. So you have your eye response, you have your verbal response, and you have your motor response. And each of these gets a score. So for eyes, you get four points for eyes. Four points if you're spontaneously opening your eyes, three points if you do it to verbal commands, two points if you do it to pain, and one point if you don't open your eyes to any stimulus. Verbal is where five points are available. So if you're alert, talking, using your name, you get five points. If you're confused, you get four points. If you're being inappropriate, you get three points. If you're mumbling and you're incomprehensible, that's a two. And if you're not saying anything to any stimulus, then that's a one. All right, the motor score is worth six points. So if you're obeying commands, you get all six. If you localize the pain, then that's worth five points. If you, so the motor score is worth all, is worth, so the motor score is worth six points. And if you're following commands, you get all six points. If you localize the pain, that's worth five points. If you withdraw from pain, that's four points. If you have flexion to pain, that's worth three points. If you have an extensor posture to pain, that's worth two points. And if you have no movement at all, that's worth one point. So you can see that the lowest Glasgow Coma score you can get is three points. And the greatest score you could get were eyes for four, verbal for five, or motor for six is worth 15 points. Now, one thing that's interesting when we look at trauma outcomes, trauma outcomes are correlated to how good the motor score is. So practice with your friends, get good at identifying the eyes, verbal, and motor score for Glasgow Coma, and you'll be able to quickly evaluate disability in your trauma patient. A couple of other things about the Glasgow Coma Score or disability is that if you have a reduced GCS, you want to assume brain injury until proven otherwise. Also, you want to prevent secondary injury if you have a brain injury. And how do you do this? You prevent secondary injury by number one, maintaining good oxygen and maintaining good perfusion. So making sure you have your A, B, and C intact. Secondary is to be treating at a trauma center or making a decision to transport to a trauma center that has neurosurgical services. And three is to be aware that alcohol, drugs, other medications can affect the neurological status. So if you have a reduced GCS, assume brain injury until proven otherwise and maintain oxygenation, perfusion, 
and get neurosurgical expertise. E is for exposure. So you want to completely expose the patient on arrival at Trauma Bay, and this includes removing all of the clothing so you can perform your primary survey, secondary survey, and begin treating the patient. Sometimes you have to do this with shears to cut off the clothing. I remember as a surgery resident in Utah where I did my training, awesome program by the way, there were a couple of times where we would use shears and unfortunately cut through a down jack in the winter and get feathers everywhere, but you know, you have to do what you have to do to get the clothing off, get the patient exposed. You can clean up the down feathers later. Now when you completely expose and undress the patient, that patient's gonna start getting cold right? They're going to start losing heat. So you want to prevent that heat loss and you can do that in a few ways. Number one is a part of the trauma timeout before the patient even gets there, you want to jack up the temperature of the trauma bay. You want that to be a warm environment. Second is you want to, after you expose the patient, you want to get some warm blankets on them and prevent that extra heat loss. Three is you want to use warmed IV fluids or an IV fluid warmer in order to deliver warm fluids to the patient and prevent added heat loss. And we've talked about this lethal triad of acidosis, hypovolemia, and hypothermia. You can avoid part of that triad just by keeping the patient warm. So cover the patient with warm blankets, have a warm environment, use warm fluids, and control hemorrhage. So A, B, C, D, and E, Airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, that's your primary survey. And there are some adjuncts to your sur primary survey or some things that are really helpful in giving you more data to care for this patient. I'm gonna go through those right now. So let's check this out. The adjuncts to primary survey are number one on top, I have what I think are kind of the more important ones. So a chest X-ray, give you a good idea of What's going on in the chest? Do you have clear lung fields or do you have a hemothorax or a pneumothorax? A pelvic x-ray, give you an idea. Do you have to be worried about bleeding in the pelvic cavity from a pelvic fracture? Knowing your ventilatory rate is gonna help you keep those end tidal CO2s or the right level of carbon dioxide during your resuscitation. The E-FAST, extended focused assessment with sonography and trauma is gonna help you evaluate if there's any bleeding in the abdomen or if there can be a pneumothorax or other problems. ECG is gonna be very helpful as well, and pulse oximetry. In addition, though not totally essential, a gastric catheter can help decompress the stomach, a urinary catheter can help you get access and start measuring your urine output, capnography or measure your CO2 levels, and of course an arterial blood gas is helpful and give you some data on acid-based disturbances as well as some a quick CBC, hemoglobin level, and electrolytes. So after your primary survey, there's one big question that you need to answer. Do you need to transfer? Does your facility have the capabilities to care for this patient? Now for the residents out there, for the students that are taking exams, one thing that comes up in these exams, whether it's through ATLS or your board exams, is do you have the knowledge of when you need to transfer a patient? And so if you're at a center that doesn't have neurosurgical capabilities and you identify a patient that has a high risk for head injury, you need to get that patient to neurosurgical expertise. And it's important to think about, does my facility have everything that I need to care for this patient? If you don't, you need to transfer. And there are some special populations in trauma which are important to know. So first is the elderly. So the elderly typically have comorbidities. They may be on blood thinning medications. They may have less compliance and they're gonna have different problems that you have to be aware of when you're taking care of them in a trauma situation. Pediatric patients, so children, that's my expertise. So children have different anatomic variables, whether that has to do with the airway or the flexibility of the bones so you can get pretty significant trauma in the chest without having any broken ribs. So you have to know the anatomic variance in children and how that applies when they have injury. 
Another special population is our pregnant women. So pregnant women obviously have a gravid uterus and that's gonna change your abdominal exam. They also gonna have higher circulating volumes and we'll get to some of these specifics when we talk about special populations in a later video. So let's move on to the secondary survey. Now the secondary survey, it's really important to remember that the secondary survey does not begin until the primary survey is complete, resuscitation is started, and the patient is responding with improved vital signs. If you haven't gotten to this point, then you need to continue the primary survey and collect more data from those adjuncts to the primary survey that we talked about. So the secondary survey begins with the history. So one easy way to get a history or some highlights of the history is by using AMPLE. So AMPLE stands for allergies, medications, past surgical and medical history, the last meal that they had, events surrounding the injury, and of course the mechanism of injury. When we think mechanism of injury, or we're talking about the mechanism of injury, we're talking about was this a blunt injury like a motor vehicle accident? Was this a penetrating injury like a gunshot wound? Or was this a burn where you also have to be worried about inhalation injury? So take a look at these scenes. So this one is obviously a motor vehicle crash. You have a front crash, you have maybe a spider defect on the windshield, you have a broken steering wheel. What are the patterns of injuries you need to worry about if you're given this information? Next is a side impact motor vehicle collision where the driver's side is totally crushed in from a T-bone. So what types of injuries are you gonna think about in this scenario? And third is a penetrating injury of the chest. Here you see some lung exposed. What type of injuries are you going to be thinking about in this pattern? So knowing the mechanism will help guide you to what organs that you have to start thinking about in your primary survey and following the primary and secondary survey when you're getting definitive control and definitive treatment, where are you going to look to start fixing that problem? Second part of our secondary survey is of course the physical exam. So we want to move sequentially through the physical exam. We begin with the head and scalp. We want to look to see, are there any scalp lacerations? Are there any obvious depressed skull fractures? We go to the maxillofacial exam. We find out, is there mandibular fractures? Is the mid face stable? Are the pupils equal and reactive? Are there any ophthalmic injuries? Then I move to the chest and the abdomen. Are there any obvious deformities? For the abdomen, is there any bruising? Is the abdomen distended? Are there any penetrating injuries? move to the genitalia and the perineum, do a full examination of the extremities, and of course do a neurological examination. When it comes to examining the spine, usually I'll do this directly following the primary survey. So after I've secured the airway, breathing, circulation, we've done a check for disability, got our GCS, and we've got the patient fully exposed, I'll log roll up and check the cervical spine, maintaining cervical inline stabilization, check the cervical, the thoracic, and the lumbar spine for any deformities, any step-offs, or if the patient is conscious and can respond, is there any point area of tenderness? And that'll give me a quick spine exam. Then log roll the patient back, maintaining cervical, thoracic, and lumbar stability, and then go on with my secondary survey. Of course, there are adjuncts to the secondary survey, just like the primary survey, and this is gonna give you additional data so you can completely care for this trauma patient. So let's look at a few of these. So in the secondary survey, you're gonna to wanna to get cross-sectional imaging, perhaps. Plain films of the spine will help you rule out cervical, thoracic, or lumbar fractures. Plain films of the extremities, if you're worried that there might be a fracture or other sort of problem. Uh, a skeletal survey in a child that you're worried about, child abuse or non-accidental trauma. Additional labs are helpful. Echocardiogram if you're worried about blunt cardiac injury. Contrast urography if perhaps you have blood at the mediatus of the penis and you're worried about a urethral or a bladder injury. And of course endoscopy if indeed is that is indicated. One thing that I can't say enough is that trauma patients need to be continuously evaluated because as the trauma resuscitation goes, things will change and you want to see constant improvement. If you don't see constant improvement and all of a sudden you get a 
If you don't see a constant improvement, all of a sudden you start getting reduced blood pressure or you start getting reduced oxygen saturations or you're getting less perfusion in the patient, you have to go back to A in your primary survey, clear the airway again, listen for breath sounds. Did they have an evolving hemothorax that's now a massive hemothorax? In the abdomen, are they collecting blood? Do they need more resuscitation with volume? Do they need to get to the operating room? As you th see things change, you need to constantly be re-evaluating and start back at the top of the primary survey if indeed the patient is not making improvement. After you've done your trauma resuscitation, done your primary secondary survey, you've done your adjuncts to your secondary survey, which may include cross-sectional imaging, this is where you go to definitive care. Now, definitive care may be continued evaluation with serial abdominal exams or serial hemoglobins. Definitive care may be an emergency exploratory laparotomy for bleeding in the abdomen. The secondary survey is gonna help you decide where that patient needs to go, whether that's discharge from the ER, whether that's admission to the floor, admission to the ICU, or go directly to the operating room. So let's summarize this up. When we put this all together, we know that the initial assessment management of the trauma patient, you have the pre-hospital phase and the hospital phase. We talked a little bit about the pre-hospital phase, gave a big shout out to our pre-hospital providers because they are absolutely vital in getting patients transported to the hospital for definitive care. We talked about the primary survey, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. We talked about adjuncts to the primary survey. So that can be chest x-ray, pelvic x-ray, an EFAST exam, and then we'll talk about these later as well. We talked about our secondary survey, which is your history and physical exam and adjuncts to the secondary survey. We talked about the decision to transport, whether you need to be at a specialized center for perhaps neurosurgical services or neurosurgical expertise. And then of course, we talked about definitive care. Knowing these is a really important beginning to assessing your trauma patient, and so I hope you enjoyed this talk today. If you have any questions, definitely leave a comment. I love engaging with you guys. Also, be sure to subscribe. Check out citizensurgeon.com. Sign up for the community. I've started using Circle as a platform so we can get a uh, engaged community, and this is going to be a great resource if you have questions about applying to surgical residency, or you have questions about fellowship or what it's like life as a surgeon, definitely check out Citizen Surgeon because I'm building that community and I'd love for you to be a part of it. All right, make sure to subscribe, check out Citizen Surgeon. I'll see you in the comments or in the community. Bye-bye.